This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, so Ariel Saskin is a fourth-year PhD candidate to studying Greek and Roman art and archaeology at Case Western Reserve University, and uh, is an alumna of the 68th class of the American Numismatic Society uh, some graduate summer seminar and of the Summer Institute for Technical Studies in Art at the Harvard Art Museum. She holds an MA from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU and a BA cum laude from Tulane University, Tulane University, sorry. Her research focuses on how ancient artisans shaped public, private, and community identities through material culture, with special interest in image, replica in image replication, distribution, and coinage. She's the research lead um, for the Kelvin Smith Library Specialist Collection, Roman coin, uh, the Roman Coin Collection, and has worked as the curatorial intern in the Department of Greek and Roman Art at the Cleveland Museum of Art. And uh, Ariel has also presented at national and international conferences and has participated in the American excavation in Samothrace for the last, past three years. So thank you, Ariel. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Okay, let's get started. Okay, and just shrink everyone down. Okay, can everyone hear me all right? And everybody can see the screen? All right, good afternoon everyone. And thank you, Lucia, for the lovely introduction. And thank you so much for the American Numismatic Society for inviting me to, the, to speak with you this afternoon and for their support in developing this project. My presentation today is based on my research from the Eric P. Newman Graduate Seminar in Numismatics this past summer. I am focusing on coinage as symbolic of a complex dialogue between the Judeans and Romans during the first century CE. This dialogue consists of two parts, as will my presentation. The first focuses on the Judean perspective with the year four bronzes of the first Jewish revolt, and the second focuses on the Roman perspective with the subsequent Judea Copta issues of Vespasian and fines related to the Flavian triumph. The year four issues and the Jewish revolt are embedded in a long history of Roman occupation in Judea. When I refer to Judea in this presentation, I mean the socio-political entity conceived of by Rome, not just the regional unit of Jerusalem and its immediate surroundings. To get you all situated, I will begin with a brief summary. In 63 BCE, Pompey intervened in a conflict between the two heirs of the Hasmonean dynasty, the ruling Jewish family that had been in power as an independent kingdom since freeing Judea from the Seleucids. Since then, throughout the late Republic and early Imperial periods, the Jews of Judea and its Roman administrators came into frequent and in some periods constant conflict over religion, uh, territorial borders, and finances. These conflicts boiled over to a full-scale revolt in 66 CE, with the procurator of Judea under Nero stealing funds from the temple in Jerusalem. The high priests declared a cessation of sacrifices on behalf of the emperor, and the revolt officially began. We have a solid narrative idea of the course of the revolt from Flavius Josephus, a Jewish commander who surrendered and was taken into Flavian service. He chronicled the events in his Jewish War and Antiquities of the Jews, which have survived in almost their entirety. However, he makes no mention of the extensive and voluminous numismatic program that was issued during the revolt by the Jewish rebels. The revolt issued coins in both silver and bronze, with the silver issues maintaining a consistent iconography throughout the five years of the revolt. In the bronzes, however, there is a major shift in the fourth year. Aha. Uh, in order to explore the meanings of the year four bronzes, I use iconography and iconology to identify the images and to analyze the contextual significance of those images within the wider visual language. 
and social history to analyze the images within the social and historical context of their creation. I have two arguments in uh, parallel to the two parts of this presentation. My first part is that Sukkot imagery on the year four coins, in addition to being religiously significant, is a multivalent group of symbols that engages with both the history of the revolt itself and the root cause of the revolt, Roman interference with traditional Judean agricultural practices. And then in part two, as part of its expansionist agenda, Rome used botanical imperialism, literally and figuratively taking foreign plants to incorporate territories into the Republic and empire. And this can be seen at work in Judea in the Judea Capta coins of the Flavians, the Flavian Triumph, and the Templum Pacus. And now let us begin with part one, the Judean perspective. Here are the particular coin types that I examine in this presentation. Their denominations are in quotes as the legends only specify half, quarter, or eighth. However, as Judea remained on the shekel weight standard, scholars generally agree that the year fours relate to the shekel standard as well. Each of the coins both uh, depict both lulavs and etrogs, relate ritual plants related to the holiday of Sukkot, also called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths. And here on the screen is what you can find most lulavs and etrogs looking like today. The plants are first obliquely described in Leviticus and sometimes referred to as the four species, uh, meaning the four species that are included in the lulav, which is uh, the date palm frond, myrtle branch and willow branch, and the etrog. And the year four bronzes are the first time that these plants appear on any Judean material culture that we know of. The dyes for these coins are very well made and very detailed. There's a clear attention to specificity and accuracy despite being made in the middle of a major military conflict. All of the required elements of the lulav are clearly depicted and included, and the etrogs are rendered with stippling to indicate the rough texture of their skin. So someone handling these coins, uh, for example, would be able to identify all of the elements without being able to see them. You could identify the different components simply by feel. And the year, importance of the year four bronzes at these these are the first explicitly religiously Jewish iconography on a large coin issue. It's the first use of popular religious symbols on Jewish coinage. The lulav and the etrog were carried by all celebrants of Sukkot, not just by the high priests. And it's uh, significant in its shift from the iconography and denominations from the previous Jewish revolt series. There was a small issue of uh, coins with a menorah and showbread table in the late Hasmonean period, but it was very short-lived. Additionally, coins with religious-related imagery uh, previously were more about religious authority than ritual or belief. So these are the uh, coins that were circulating prior to the year four. So we have the years one through three silver shekel, and the silver shekel was continued into year four. And then we have the bronze pruta. The silver shekel issues are very high quality and consistently depict a chalice and pomegranate branch or staff, which are associated with the temple priesthood. The bronze pruta, smaller bronze issues of the first three years depict an amphora and a grape leaf and are a riff off an early Roman pr procuratorial issue. Each coin includes a letter uh, and a legend in Paleo-Hebrew. So to sum up the situation in year four, uh, when Judea went into the revolt, they began a new calendar with the year one of the war uh, overlapping with 66 uh, common era. Each coin issue includes a year marker on the description, therefore allowing us to align the coin issues with historical events. As we move into year four, there are a lot of changes happening. Uh, so we are at the Siege of Jerusalem. Over the course of the war, the Jews have lost most of their territory over the previous years of fighting. The core areas still in rebellion are Herodium, Masada, and Jerusalem. Survivors from other regions have flocked to Jerusalem and the temple for refuge. Infighting among the revolt factions led to the destruction of Jerusalem's grain stores. 
uh, Titus, son of Vespasian, has surrounded Jerusalem and is currently raising local groves for wood and for siege weapons and earthworks. Jerusalem falls into dire famine and starvation, but the rebels continue to fight. Now that we have the immediate context, let's just take a moment to look again at the coins to start, before we start going into the po possible whys of the imagery. Why the change in year four? The general scholarly consensus supported by Josephus uh, is that the Zealot faction of Simon bar -Giora took over the minting authority from an unknown revolutionary government when he took over Jerusalem in the beginning of year four. However, this does not adequately explain why Sukkot and agricultural imagery is now used. And scholars have primarily considered the year four bronzes to be messianic imagery, coinciding with the change in legend between the year four and the previous years, from the freedom of Jerusalem to the redemption of Jerusalem, freedom of Zion to redemption. However, the legends on the revolt coins are written in Paleo-Hebrew, which was not widely read outside the priestly class in Jerusalem. As a bronze issue, the year fours would have been more for daily use, rather than the high-level transactions of the temple. The language of the general population would be either Greek or Aramaic, and so the change in legend would likely uh, go unnoticed by most of Judea. I now consider some alternative theories. Sukkot in the Second Temple Period. Let's put it and its imagery in the context of the Jewish revolt. Sukkot is one of the four major pilgrimage holidays, the celebration of fall, the fall harvest, where all the diaspora communities converge on the temple in Jerusalem. It is the first holiday properly celebrated upon completion of the Second Temple after the Jewish return from Babylonian exile. It is a pilgrimage festival that was open to the whole community, not just Jews, but also non-Jews, as well as women and children. And it is also linked to the Hasmonean victory celebration of Hanukkah, Hanukkah starting as a makeup for a Miss Sukkot during the War for Independence. In the more immediate context, it is also the date uh, that the fall of Gaius Flaccus, a Roman governor who oppressed the Jewish community of Alexandria, um, his fall happened on Sukkot. And it was more importantly, the victory against Gaius Castius, governor of Syria, as one of the first major battles in the revolt, uh, which happened it, on, uh, on Sukkot in the first year within the outskirts of Jerusalem. While Philo of Alexandria's records of Flaccus seem out of place in the discussion of Judea, it is important to remember the role that the Jewish diaspora communities played in Judean history with the annual pilgrimage festivals, including Sukkot, and that Roman rule affected those communities as well. Now, the possible religious or social, uh, or social meanings for the Sukkot imagery on year four. Sukkot was a Jewish holiday that was accessible to the whole population, contrary to images on the previous uh, coin issues, which use imagery of authority or religious authority, and it superseded the factional divisions within the Jewish revolt, therefore symbolizing unity. The bronze coins were made for daily life transactions and so aimed at the broad audience within Jerusalem, indicating popular appeal. Sukkot historically represented a return to freedom with the inauguration of the Second Temple and the Hasmonean renewal, galvanizing the population and in their fight for freedom. And Sukkot links to the major victory of the revolt against Kestius outside Jerusalem, symbolizing the capacity of the Jewish revolt for achieving power. And on a very, very practical level, uh, the Sukkot imagery stands for agriculture. Sukkot as a harvest festival could not happen without a harvest, and the harvest could not happen without Judean agricultural freedom from Roman control. The Romans did not literally prevent Judean harvesting. However, they did control elements like the harvesting schedule, which often went against traditional Jewish practices, and the products that held value, particularly for Roman economic benefit. And now we transition into part two the Roman imperial practice in Judea. In the late Republican period, the Roman governor uh, governors, which I use loosely, the last Has Hasmoneans were still technically in power, constantly changed the borders and tax rates in Judea. 
You can see on the map the different chunks of territory that were added, subtracted, separated, and reunified between Pompey and the beginning of the revolt. Pompey's first actions when he come when he uh, invades Judea is to shrink the limits of the territory and contract publicani, uh, tax collectors, to uh, extract money from Judea. Caesar then comes in, re-expands the borders, removes the publicani, uh, and then Cassius reverses that. Antony reverses that again. Um, so we're seeing a lot of changes in monetary policy, uh, land policy, and just general management policy that is changing over very frequently in a very short amount of time. The constantly changing borders led to regional stability, exacerbated by misdeeds and even direct provocation by many of the Roman governors. Uh, we have a lot of stability uh, under Herod, but then uh, prefectural and pr procuratorial taxes um, change and become specifically agricultural taxes. We no longer have the individual publicani as far as we know, um, but it is changed to a land and agricultural tax. And um, we're getting the sort of uh, problems with a lot of these governors, not only from Jewish sources, but also from Roman sources as well. Um, they are critical of the actions of many of the governors in the region. Uh, we also have a series of tax-related conflicts that are also documented both by Judean and Roman sources. While it can be said that no one likes to pay taxes, uh, both uh, sides of the argument sort of make note of the frequency and the severity of issues in Judea. And so we see sort of a lot of these repeated issues that are coming frequently in a very short amount of time, including um, some of these, uh, the most recent one, which would be Cestius attempting to take a new census during Passover, um, which was a pilgrimage holiday, thereby artificially inflating the population numbers, which would increase their taxes, um, which would cause major economic problems. And we also see in the record that the Roman occupation fundamentally changed the Judean economy. Archaeological evidence shows a huge shift in material culture starting in the mid first century BCE, so around the time that Pompey uh, is coming into Judea. New ceramic workshops and object types appear. Standardized commodity storage vessels develop either to store their uh, grain for submitting taxes or to store things for personal use uh, while the rest of their uh, harvest is being sent for taxes. Um, and then we're also seeing a lot of mikvot, Jewish ritual baths, beginning to appear in domestic and public spaces, indicating major changes in water management practices. Evidence also shows a simultaneous shift in land, ma land management with increased consolidation of land holding, fewer and larger farms, and a decreased variety in crop production. Evidence of common Roman economic pro products, including wine and olive oil, start to appear in the archaeological record as well, along with Roman-style presses. In opposition to many of these changes, Judean workshops focused on more locally based products, such as the knife-paired lamps, as seen on the screen, uh, and stone tableware, as an alternative to Roman imports. This is not to say that there was a wholesale rejection of Roman material culture in Judea. As many of the elite households that have been excavated have wall paintings and uh, remnants of Roman ceramics. The impact of Roman administration on Judean material culture, though, uh, and economy is clearly significant and widespread. The economic impact of Roman control was felt most keenly in the agricultural sphere. Both Roman and Jewish sources discuss the economic importance of the date palm and the balsam, which I will return to later. So we can see sort of going back even into the Greek world that um, Judea is known for the date palm and for the balsam as their major uh, export products and their major agricultural products overall. The date palm, which is not to be confused with palm branch iconography, um, is when I refer to the entire tree. And often it is depicted with um, fruit bundles, which is what the date palm is known for, producing dates. It is central to the iconography of Judea for Rome. So this is not an iconography that primarily came out of Judea. Rome sort of began to use this iconography for Judea first. 
And the best groves were the royal properties, so Hasmonean properties, even prior to that, the kingdom properties, um, and returning to the Sukkot imagery, uh, the date palm frond is one of the elements of the Lulav bundle. The date palm on the half shekel is less directly related to Sukkot imagery, though it can allude to the first fruit sacrifice that is part of the holiday, because we see here the date palm tree, but also baskets full of fruit. It leans more directly into the agricultural focus of Sukkot and on the coins, uh, thus our foray into Roman imper uh, botanical imperialism begins. Botanical imperialism was first uh, defined by Anne Pollard in her 2009 analysis of Pliny's natural history and the Flavian Templum Pacus. And in summary, it is the ideological and practical constructs and claims of cultural hegemony and military power that develop out of collected and transported plants. Starting to sound a little bit familiar, in addition to the constantly uh, changing availability of land and taxes, there are specific instances of targeted Roman appropriation of date palms and balsam. Most notably, Antony grants Cleopatra the date palm and balsam groves of Herod, and then upon Herod's death, the Roman administration under Augustus cedes Herod's estate, including the date palm and balsam groves. Uh, and as far as we know, they weren't entirely returned. Uh, when Judea is officially made a province in 6 CE, the first coins minted by the Roman administration feature the date palm, with a particular emphasis on the fruit, uh, fruit clusters. They are very large, they are very apparent, and rendered in high relief. So this is a bronze pruta of Caponius, the first procurator of Judea. We see the date palm imagery repeating over time um, in particularly the Roman administrative coins. It is not exclusively nor consistently used on the coins issued for Judea, but it does repeat periodically and is used um, frequently. All of these coins were local issues meant to circulate within Judea. The date palm recurs on Roman administrative uh, coins periodically, and then Herod Antipas, ruling as tetrarch with Roman permission in Galilee and Perea, uh, also mints local coins with date palms, though they are clearly stylistically different and very short-lived. Vitellius is technically the first to bring the date palm imagery to the imperial stage, with a Cestertius minted at Rome. However, the shield on the reverse blocks the place where the fruit would be depicted, so the iconography is not exact. Vitellius had connections to Judea, particularly through his father's role as governor of the province of Syria under Tiberius, and therefore overseer of Roman administration of Judea as well. These issues are the predecessors to the Flavian Judea Capta image program and are often included together in scholarship, but do not bear a legend specifying Judea. Vespasian's coinage makes it far more explicit a depiction of the date palm, with full fruit visible on most of the coinage types. However, he goes a step further than iconography with Titus's bringing of date palms from Judea for their joint uh, triumph in 71 CE. Claire Rowan recently reintroduced Roman-led tokens into the scholarly discourse, including several tokens likely made for the Flavian triumph in Rome. The tokens clearly depict date palms in wheeled carts. The lack of root balls in the depictions are a common convention for trees and transport in Roman art, such as the Pompeian wall painting only preserved in drawings depicting a wedding procession from uh, Regio 7947, the House of Mars and Venus, or the House of the Wedding of Hercules. So we can see on the screen that we have uh, these date palms. Uh, you can see the fruit is here. And then even this one on the bottom uh, right says Jude on the, um, the obverse. So these, seem, these are very sort of specifically related to uh, the Flavian imagery and their interaction with Judea. Pliny does not discuss uh, date palms in relation to the Flavians in their natural history, but he expounds on their taking of balsam, the other major botanical product of Judea, for the Flavian triumph and later exploitation. Balsam does not appear in any iconography either from Judea or Rome, but in literature, 
Balsam and date palms are almost universally described together, and one could metonymically uh, be substituted for the other. As early as Theophrastus, the properties of transplanting foreign botanicals were known, and it has been argued and appears likely that some of the balsam paraded in the Flavian Triumph was replanted in the trenches of the Flavian Templum Pacus. The most recent reconstruction includes an extensive gardening area supported by trenches and waterworks in the archaeological record. Balsam is identified as a shrub, and therefore it would be small, small enough to fit within the space allotted. The botanical collection of the Templum Pacus therefore parallels the art and the treasure collection, with an eye toward the global, but centered on the spoils of Judea. Possibly because of this, balsam starts to appear very frequently in Flavian literature, appearing in Statius, Martial, and Juvenal. Date palms, however, cannot fruit in Italy. However, their economic value could be outweighed by the date palms' symbolic, uh, symbolic value. A comparison perhaps could be made to the Julio-Claudian laurel grove at the Ad Galinus Albus, which lasted only as long as the dynasty, according to Suetonius or the imported cherry trees of Lucullus, or more fittingly, the ebony and plane trees of Pompey, later the latter of which were planted in the Porticus Pompeiana. There are numerous known public gardens and groves in Rome that could possibly house date palms planted from the Flavian Triumph, and as archaeobotany advances, we may yet find them. Regardless of whether or not the date palms were replanted in Rome for the long term, Date palms were both physically and symbolically placed under Roman domination in parallel to Judea itself. In the end, the revolt's icons of freedom became Rome's icons of possession. In conclusion, the Sukkot imagery on the year four bronzes of the Jewish revolt is not generalized messianic imagery. It represents a shift in rationale in coinage iconography during the siege of Jerusalem moving from symbols based in authority to popular accessible religious objects meant to galvanize the population under siege. It conveys the priorities of religious and agricultural independence among the revolting population of Judea, based on continuous interference in both aspects of life by the Romans since Pompey's invasion. Sukkot imagery also operates within the historical context of the revolt as the first major victory took place during the holiday in 66. Including the fruiting date palm among the Sukkot imageries in the year four uh, highlights the agricultural aspects of both Sukkot as a harvest festival and of Judean life. The Romans used the date palm symbolically and literally to exploit Judea, culminating in the Flavian Judea Copta iconographic program, including coinage, the triumph, and the Templum Pacus. Thank you. Me. Thank you all for this um, very, very interesting talk. Um, I'll open here. I already see that there are some, uh, oh, there are no questions here in the chat. Uh, I don't know if we have uh, any questions uh, from the audience. Otherwise, of course, I'll begin. I'll, uh, I'll open with some questions on my own. Okay, uh, David Handing says, thanks you. Yes, that's great. Okay, so if nobody has questions, so I'll begin. Um, so I find, uh, I find incredibly interesting, but we already discussed this, this uh, uh, last summer, this summer, um, the, the relationship uh, uh, between uh, um, the relationship between the local representation of the date palm and uh, uh, the representation on um, uh, on provincial coinage. Let's sorry, no, on imperial coinage. Sorry, not on provincial, on imperial coinage. So, um, what do you think it tells us about the? way the imperial mint, for example, worked, or uh, in terms of exactly like who, 
uh, of agency in terms of deciding which image has to be put, for example, on imperial coinage? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, one thing that I was sort of focusing on and I've looked at a little bit in my research is, um, let me see if I can go back to, yeah, the Vespasian coins, um, is that um, pretty consistently that um, the numbers of the uh, branches of the date palm, um, they're pretty consistently uh, for at least um, Vespasian's coinage, uh, they're either seven branches or five branches. And we'll often see sort of the seven branch in this um, full tree sort of type. And then we'll see five um, in the, um, the sort of half tree types. And the five, um, the five branches are used um, first in the coins of Vitellius, yes. Um, However, looking at uh, closely at a lot of the issues and looking at some of the dyes that are available, um, it's not necessarily consistent. I don't think that the uh, dye engravers were instructed to have specific numbers, um, even though the, the seven branch sort of parallels Jewish use of possibly the date palm paralleling the menorah. Um, we do see the five and seven sort of coming up in consistently. Like those are pretty much the only two numbers that I've seen. Again, I have not looked at the entire uh, uh, realm of Judea Capta issues. I've only focused primarily on uh, early Vespasian, um, but seems to be pretty consistent. It's either five or seven, but within the same uh, type, the different dyes um, are not sort of like all the same. You'll see fives and sevens for the same type. Um, so there does seem to be some control, but there doesn't seem to be any specific instruction for the die engravers to specifically have a number of branches um, uh, in their dies. Thank you. Uh, of course, I have a lot of questions for Ariel, but see if there are others here now. So then I'll can you please uh, um, explain um, uh, a little bit uh, more, which is very interesting, uh, um, the difference? I mean, you are focusing, of course, on the bronze coinage of the, first of all, and specifically on the year four. But what is the relationship between, for example, the silver coinage and the bronze coinage mm -hmm. during the revolt? Yeah, thank you. Do, do, do. Let's go back. Um, so for me, it's really interesting. Um, sorry, I have to go back through all the way um, uh, to see sort of the stylistic differences that are occurring uh, between the bronzes of the first three years and then these bronzes um, of year four. Because um, what I'm seeing, and I've I've handled some of these at uh, you know, over the summer uh, as part of the seminar um, in that sort of the actual fracture of the year four bronzes is much closer to the technical factor of the silvers. So they're larger, their dyes are crisper, they're sort of rounded on the edges, which you can kind of see in these pictures. The prutote are considerably smaller. They tend to be thinner um, their edges are more fragile. The the um, the the flans for them are smaller. They're much thinner. So we're seeing some kind of change both in the iconography and the actual manufacture of the coins. And that is something definitely I'd like to pursue more. Um, let's see. Where's the next closest? Here we go. So you can kind of see that we're seeing these these larger. Um, these larger blanks with these beaded edges that are very similar to the way that the silvers are being manufactured. Um, the scale is bigger, the dyes are more detailed. And on the eighth, we can see the chalice um, that is that appears on the silvers previously is also being used again. And it's possible that, um, you know, the same 
groups of people are doing the dye engraving for these new bronzes now, um, which is very interesting. And um, it's really because we don't sort of have a lot of literary evidence about or any lit literary evidence for the most part about who was making these coins, sort of trying to establish the manufacturer um, you know, suggesting that maybe there was a different group that was minting the Prutote than was minting the silvers, and then they wind up minting the silvers and the bronzes in the year four, um, which is definitely something that is possible and uh, merits further study. Thank you. Um, so I, I heard from, uh, uh, I received a message saying that the Q&A function is not active for these, seem to be active. But anyway, if anybody has a question, you can just type it uh, in the chat uh, or just unmute yourself uh, and ask uh, the question directly if you'd like to. Uh, I'll ask uh, just another question. And uh, if there are no, oh, yes. There you go, let's see. Um, so can you tell me something uh, more? Can you tell us something more about uh, how, let's say, you already discussed this a little bit, but how the political uh, significance of Sukkot changed between, of course, before, between the pre-Roman age, let's say, and the Roman age, so how different it is and uh, how significant you think it is for this kind of representations of coinage. Mm -hmm. um, so in terms of sort of, let's see, we can go back to, oh, no, uh, the history of Sukkot. I don't, as far as we know and from documented as uh, sources, um, sort of there's changes between the first temple period and the second temple period, um, but not necessarily inter uh, but not necessarily sort of pre um, pre Roman and post Roman. There doesn't seem to be any um, specific sort of active changes that I'm aware of. Um, but I can say that um, the Romans were definitely sort of aware of this these pilgrimage. Uh, holidays and seem to have often the prefects and the procurators, they would bring the legions uh, to Jerusalem for these pilgrimage holidays um, to sort of supervise because there's such a, a an influx of population. Um, and that sort of, we don't see it, uh, we don't have a lot of specific mentions from Sukkot, but we do see it on, for uh, example, Passover. Um, where, you know, the Romans are coming in and somebody's making rude gestures uh, and the whole crowd goes like completely nuts over it. Um, so we're seeing uh, definitely tensions that are happening during these pilgrimage holidays. But in terms of, um, you know, limited practices under Roman occupation, um, I, we don't see specific sort of religious injunctions taking place. Um, what is possible, however, and is sort of maybe related to um, to the coinage is, um, you know, having to rearrange land distribution um, in that much more land has to be devoted to, um, you know, growing specific crops for taxes, leaving less land to grow the willows and the myrtles um, to, and the etrogim um, for the holiday. You know, those are being grown for specific religious purposes. Once they're away from the tree, they can't really grow any further. So it's sort of this non-economic um, aspect, but it is using resources that could be devoted to economic purposes, um, which could possibly cause tensions in land management. Right. Uh, very last question. And then I'll, I'll, I'll promise I'll, I'll, uh, I'll let you go unless... Um, now... You uh, explained uh, the fact that uh, the date, that in reality, the, the most economically important, the most important product from the economic point of view uh, from Judea was actually the balsam, that 
is not uh, that is not represented on coinage, while the date is represented uh, on coinage. So how this representation of the date palm uh, relates to this boca botanical imperialism that you were talking about, you know, because of course botanical imperialism is through, of course, and express itself through uh, these plants. But the date palm also, which is symbolizes Judea, and you clearly shown those beautiful tokens. Uh, They're just um, amazing, really, for the, but at the same time, that's, yeah, that's not, uh, you know, that's not the most relevant uh, product from, uh, um, from Judea. Let's say from the economic point of view. Well, the economic point of view that we have, particularly for balsam versus date palms, is primarily this passage from Pliny. Mm -hmm. um, and balsam, you know, is a high value scent. It is something that is made for more elite people, mm -hmm. though, of course, it does become more accessible um, to the population uh, during the Flavian period. Um, date palms, on the other hand, um, we see that from multiple literary sources that there is a large scale sort of awareness of them and that the date palm, the dates produced in Judea are some among the best. Um, but that sort of the growth of them is restricted to Judea. They don't fruit um, primarily outside um, of sort of the dry, hot uh, regions. Um, so they've uh, I think Theophrastus discusses it where they tried to transplant date palms and they would grow, but they wouldn't fruit, um, which sort of made them less economically valuable in that sense. However, the balsam seems to be able to survive in Italy. Um, and I believe Pliny mentions that sort of within a few, the first few years of them bringing it to Rome, they, uh, you know, are able to get 800,000 sesterces um, from selling balsam and its products so um it i think it becomes you know based on this we are uh, the romans are physically taking balsam um and bringing it to rome and through the coins through the um the tokens we're seeing that they're probably also physically taking the date palms which is definitely an aspect of botanical imperialism even though iconographically we're only seeing the date palm there doesn't seem to be sort of a distinctiveness uh in the appearance of balsam to sort of be iconographically significant you can put a bush you can call it balsam but is anybody going to recognize yeah, it yeah yeah of course of course makes perfect sense uh if there are no other questions uh, I I think at this point uh, we can uh, really thank Ariel for this wonderful presentation and also thank you for enduring uh, all my questions. <laughs> but you're sort of used to that. So and um, we will have uh, let's see if there is more and you have we have all uh, the people thanking you for this wonderful and very, very, very clear presentation. And uh, I think you're coming back, right? For a long table, when? Yes, um, I will be doing another long table at the end of November, uh, November 22nd, to sort of introduce a new slash old collection of coins that has been sort of uh, reintroduced at uh, here at Case Western Reserve University. So I'll be showing some of the coins from that collection, talking about the history, um, and hopefully showing you some of our lovely new digital images. Um, and so they can be studied and Everybody can love them as much as I do. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, really. Of bye course. bye, Ariel. Thank, thank you so much. Thank for you, having Ariel. Me. Thank you.